You know what every single person needs to hear this morning. So, Father, I pray that as I preach, that you would guide my words, that you would guide my, my tone, that you would guide everything, that it would fall upon fertile soil, God, that you would remove distractions from our minds, that you would remove uh, a spirit of defense, Lord, and that you would allow us to, to, be, to receive things this morning. God, I pray that if there is any jealousy or selfish ambition in the hearts this morning, God, that you would expose it by your kind hand, that you would bring it to our minds, that we would repent of it and turn to you. God, we pray that we would be a people that are pure, that are peaceable and gentle, full of mercy, impartial and sincere. God, we pray that you would work righteousness in our congregation, that we would be a people who sow peace and sow righteousness into those around us. So God, we pray that you would do now what um, far more than we could possibly ask or think. Do a work in your church for the glory of your name. We ask this in the, the name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if you talk to the average person, um, what they will tell you is that they love the fall. Uh, why they love the fall? Because there's no longer the, the blistering heat of South Carolina bearing down on you, making one sweat, walking to your car. My problem, not yours, right? They, they, they love the, the, the changing of the, the leaves, right? The, 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 the cool breeze that come in. Uh, but often when they talk about the fall, they, they, they forget that although those leaves are beautiful when they change colors, they are not beautiful on the ground. And when you uh, are living, uh, at least in my neighborhood, I have to rake leaves or take care of leaves at the beginning of July. That's when the first dead leaves fall and my yard is full of dead leaves. And I do that all the way through January, right? It's a little unfair to have fall last that long. Uh, a few years ago when I moved to... I think that might be my, my microphone. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to use this one. Is that okay? Thank you, Daniel, for saying that. Um, so where I used to live, I never had to do any yard work because I lived on a camp property, and they handed all the yard work for me. It was, it was a glorious thing. And when I moved, I, I realized I had to take care of things myself. And I started taking care of my own yard and with my leaf blower. And then one day, my leaf blower started smoking. It started smoking out of the back. And I'm like, this is really strange. And there's a man in the neighborhood who kind of, kind of really kind of takes care of most of the people's yards. And I said, Charlie, what's going on with my leaf blower? He goes, well, what kind of gas are you using? <laughs> using the stuff that's from the gas station. <laughs> he said, that's your problem, right? I was putting in the wrong gas. I didn't put the little oil in and mix it up. So I was destroying the leaf blower. Um, I know, bless me, right? <laughs> not, not the first time that I've made a mistake using a, a power tool, if you want to call that a power tool. Um, but what the problem was, I was putting the wrong thing in the tank. Because I was putting the wrong thing in the tank, I was destroying uh, the tool. And I, I think often we are allowing the wrong fuel to go into our, our tank. Now, this is really the, the picture of all, all the, the Bible is that we are either going to live by true wisdom, wisdom that comes down from above, putting the right things into our tank, or we are going to, to live by the, the wisdom of the world. Unspiritual, as the text says, demonic, earthly wisdom and we're going to live by that and what's going to happen is that we are going to wreck the tool that God has made he's going to we're going to wreck us we're going to live by worldly wisdom we're going to be like putting the wrong fuel in our tank and that we are going to be corrupted and twisted and so often when we look at the script the scripture we, we come to it and we we have this natural defense to say well that's not me well I pray this morning as we walk through this text you would just you would see the the, the battle that we face to, to live in wisdom there's three things I want to show with you today from this text. It's a short uh, passage, which does not mean a short sermon, just a short passage. Um, the first one is the wisdom of works, the wisdom of, of works. And really the, the question here in verse 13, I think is that one of the questions, probably the key question that James is trying to drive home throughout this entire letter. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Now, remember, he has certain people in the church who are saying, I am wise and I am understanding because of my faith. I have this faith, therefore I'm wise and understanding. And James says, show me your wisdom and show me your understanding by your 
actions. I don't want to hear just your words. I want to show, show me your faith. So this, in chapter 2, we have that question. Do we have a faith that saves? Because you know, we know that faith alone saves. But saving faith is never alone. It always comes with a change of life. It comes with repentance. It comes with sanctification. So that question that he's asking, who is wise and understanding among you, is the key question. You may even phrase it in other phrases. Do you have saving faith or a faith that saves? Do you, do you have pure religion? Would be another way that James phrases it. I believe it's the core argument of the entire book. And, and what does he say? Second half of verse, verse, verse 13. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So if you say that you have faith, if you're here today, if you are a Christian saying that you have a saving faith, the Bible says, show your faith with your lives. Show your faith with, with good works. That doesn't mean don't speak of your faith because one of the works of faith is to speak of your faith. The Bible commands us time and time again to proclaim his name. And do you also know this, that part of your responsibility as a, as a, as a Christian is to sing? Isn't it a glorious thing to hear singing? You know, today I had a special treat because all the kids were in the front row and uh, they sang beautifully, did they not? You know, I think the kids are doing a wonderful job and singing Rejoice in the Lord. I'm so proud of my wife and, and leading that choir. But I'll tell you what, having them sit in the front row and having them sing that close to me all together, and they were singing out. That, that is a work of God. God commands us to sing his praises. So James says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in what? The meekness of wisdom. Now, we don't often use that word today, the idea of, of meekness. James has used it before in this very epistle. So if you look in, in your Bibles, go back to uh, James chapter 1, verse 21. He uses the same language. And if you are trying to learn and understand the Bible, one of the ways that you uh, interpret the Scriptures is that you interpret the Scripture with Scripture. So if you're in the book of James, if there's a word used in one part of James, James, it's probably the same meaning in another part of James, right? That's a kind of a, a good interpretive rule. So in verse 21, it says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James is not saying you are saved by works. He's saying it's, it's how you receive the word of God. The word of God is given to you. It, it's, it's implanted to you. And it's how you respond to that word will show whether you are a true follower of Christ or, or not. The, the, the word meekness means to, to humbly, to be, to be humble, to, to be submissive. Or in, in some, in some uh, definitions, the word tame is there. Thinking about last week, the taming of the tongue. It says the, the heart, the, 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 the tongue, no one can tame. And then we see here is that when we receive the word of God with meekness, we tame our heart. We tame our, our tongue because of the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is this implanted word that is able to save you? Well, I would say it's the gospel. It's, it's the message of uh, the, the, the entire Bible. It's the good news. Uh, well, if you're here today and you're not a Christian trying to figure things out, whether you believe about, uh, about Christ, well, there's really four major movements in world history and four major movements that we see in, in the Scripture. And I would say these four major movements are the things that we hold on to as, as Christians and have to believe to be followers of Christ. And number one is creation. We believe that God is the creator of the world. And therefore, we are accountable to him. Because he created us, we respond and, and are accountable to him. Number two, the, the fall. Man fell from God's glory through sin and fractured our relationship with him. We, we look at the Garden of Eden and we think that, that Eve just took a, a, a fruit off a tree and ate. No, what she was doing, she was saying, God, I don't need you. I don't need your word. I can do it my Self. In many ways, she was living in the, in the definition of selfish ambition. I am out for myself and my glory and not the glory of the Lord. And now because of that sin, men have their hearts set on fire by hell, as we see that in, even earlier in this same chapter. And we are destined to die. The third major move in, in the scriptures and really in the world is redemption. God knew that we could not rescue ourselves. God knew that we were always going to live in jealousy and selfish ambition for our own glory. So he, therefore, he sent his son 
He sent Christ to rescue us. He came to rescue us while we were in the enemy's camp, serving the enemy. I love that song as we sing, All I Have is Christ. It says, I was, when I ran my hellbound race, indifferent, right? We didn't care what God said. That may be some of you this morning. I'm going to do things my way when I want to do it. Well, that's what all of us once were. We all were living our, our race for ourselves. And yet God opened our eyes, allowed us to see that we were sinners and that we needed a Savior. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for that sin. He was our, our substitute. He said, I will take that wrath for you. I will pay your debt. So now, what, he not only died, but he was dead and buried. God rose him from the dead. He's seated him at the right hand of God. And he sent forth his Holy Spirit into us so we can, we can believe. That's why we sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. We are redeemed from living the way we once did. Now we live differently for the Lord and his glory. Well, the last major move of scripture, we have this, this idea of the creation, fall, redemption. And then we have this thing that is yet to come, our final consummation. Beloved, life is barreling toward the end. The end when either God will uh, judge us on our death. The Bible says that it is appointed once for a man to die once and then face judgment. Hebrews 9.27. All of us one day are going to stand before God. And in that day, we have to give an account for our, our lives. Our life is barreling towards that day or the day when the trump resounds and the Lord descends and the Lord rides his white horse and his warring saints behind him, ushering in the new heavens and the new earth. That happens, right? Those are the four major moves of, our, of, of the scriptures and the four major moves, I would say, of the entire world. And that's a worldview of how we should think about life. And what we're, what we're saying here is when we receive the word of God with meekness, what we're saying is that we believe that, that believing in those four major moves of the scriptures that has the power to save our souls. We now live according to the, the wisdom that God has shown us in the scriptures. That means that we must submit to those four major areas. We must believe that God is our creator. If you're going to follow Christ, you must believe that God is your creator and you are accountable to him. And not only accountable to him, but you're now called to live for his glory. So your face, believing that he is a creator, your first question is not, what do I want? It's what does God want of me? Because he's our creator. He's our master. But we also, the second thing we have to understand when we receive this, this word, uh, this, it, it, this meekness of wisdom, it's, it's to recognize the fall, that we're sinners. And we need help. We are so easily self-deceived. We are blinded often of things in our life that we need somebody else to kind of come in and help expose. This is one of the gifts that God has given his, his people in, in the local church. You know, I was talking to someone even last night at the, at the fall family picnic about the incalculable blessings of being part of the body of Christ. Because God is, is, is said, be together, and then God works in your life in ways that we don't even know right now. The people that you sit next to, the people that you talk with, the people that you they used to encourage you or to rebuke you, to, to challenge you, to exhort you. Even here, seeing these men uh, kneel before us and seeing their humble stance to, to serve you as the, as the body and, and how humbling it is to me to see where God has, has worked in these young men's life. It's a precious thing. But we also, if we're going to receive this word and walk in the meekness of wisdom, that we need to receive Jesus as our Redeemer. From the beginning of time, even I heard this past week at, uh, at the, me and the retreat my wife and I were at, you know, Al Mohler was kept on saying, listen, from the beginning of time, God is not only our creator, but he has always planned to be our redeemer. Read Ephesians chapter one, that you were adopted in him before the creation of the world. Jesus Christ coming to the world to save us was not plan B. It was always plan A because God always wanted to be your redeemer. So we interact with God not only as creator, as the, as the transcendent, magnificent, powerful creator of thunder and, and lightning. No, we also know him as the eminent redeemer who died for us, who rose for us and sent his spirit so that we always will have his presence with us. 
That is what it means to, to walk in the meekness of wisdom. And lastly, the consummation. We no longer live for glory in this world. Now, this, this is so important for this passage is because, listen, this world will one day be gone. God's going to take it. He's going to refine it by fire and remake it and give it back to us. So if you're living for this world only, you are missing out because this world is going to fade away. It's like going to a beach and building a beautiful sandcastle, spending hours on it, thinking it's going to last forever. And then what happens when high tide comes? It's gone. I think most people are just building sandcastles. They're living for this world only. But God says, if you live for the next world, the things that are going to be destroyed here will, will make it there if you do them for my, for my glory. And I think that's, that's important, especially when we see this next topic. Okay, so number one, it's the wisdom of works, right? This wisdom of, of working from faith and believing in the gospel. Number two, it's the wisdom of worldliness, the wisdom of worldliness. I'm trying to be ironic there because I think when you try to live in the world, there really isn't wisdom. And I think that's what we see here in, in the text. So in James chapter 3, go back there. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct? Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. That's the positive, okay? Then he kind of turns it and says kind of a rebuke. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. If you have some time this week, uh, or maybe even this month, start in you know, Proverbs chapter 1 you know, in, in November 1st, you know, on Thursday, and just read through the book of Proverbs. And what you'll see is this, this idea of two duality. Two wisdoms that call aloud, right? The wisdom of the world says, follow me. And the wisdom of God says, follow me. And the choice for all of us is who we're going to choose. Now, children, in this life, there's going to be things that are you're going to kind of draw you towards the world or things that are going to draw you to God. Parents, because we know that this world has, has two wisdoms set up, you have to be very careful how you raise your kids, though, so that you're not allowing influences to come into your children's life that are calling them to be like the world. You want them to be listening to the call of, of Christ. And you college students who are, who are inundated around this liberal mind of, of thinking and, and, and this, this, this worldly worldview or this secular worldview, which really is no worldview at all, right? They're saying, live this way. Do these things. When God says, no, follow me. Live for me and my glory. What we see here is that we don't want to have jealousy or selfish ambition. Uh, there's two wit forms of jealousy. There is jealousy in the scriptures that, that the Lord says that he is a jealous God. Uh, I remember reading several years ago, uh, Oprah Winfrey um, turned her back on God is because she, saw, she heard that God was a jealous God. And in her mind, all she thought about the jealousy that I see in the world, and if God is like that kind of jealousy, I want nothing to do with God. See, the difference is, is when God is jealous, he is jealous for only that which is pure, only that is, that is loving, only that is, that is holy. So him being jealous for us is him to be jealous for the best thing in our lives, himself. He wants us to, to have more of him. That's jealous. There's, that, there's an urgency there. And you can almost kind of see it a little bit as a parent, right? You want your, you want your kids to, to have the best in life. You're jealous for them to have the best things in this life. Well, I think Oprah Winfrey got it wrong. All she saw was the worldly jealousy. It says here, it says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Meaning, if you say that you love God, but you're living in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, stop it, because you probably don't know the Lord. That's what I think he's trying to get at. Don't boast as if you have, have faith if you're living in this. One well-known novelist said, every time a friend succeeds, something inside me dies. Another writer says, jealousy is tyrannical. It is catastrophic. 
And we don't have to look other than the scriptures. If you read the book of Proverbs, you see it. It says, for jealousy makes a man furious and he will not spare when he takes revenge. Proverbs 6, 20, 34. Proverbs 14, 30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bone rot. It says, wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? The reason why I think jealousy is, is so hard is we often don't know that it's there. I, I think that many of us live according to worldly wisdom, but we don't even realize that we're living that way because jealousy kind of masks itself in different, in different ways. I, I, was, I was preparing and I was reading through Numbers 16 uh, when the people grumbled against God. We, we read it here a few uh, weeks ago. And when you, when you read it, um, you see how they grumbled against Moses and there's really no thought of jealousy. But scripture interprets scripture and we know the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Psalm 106, 16, it says, when the men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord. So they grumbled. Why did they grumble? It doesn't say in the text in number 16, but it says it in, in Psalms. Why did they grumble? They grumbled because they were jealous of the success and the place that God called Moses and, and Aaron. See, the visible sin was grumbling, but the seed of that sin was jealousy. We, we even see this with Saul and David, right? Uh, where they, they came back after war and and the people said, you know, Saul has killed his thousands and, and David his tens of thousands. And, and, and Saul was jealous. They loved David more than me. So what did Saul want to do? He wanted to kill him. He wanted to murder him. He wanted him dead. Now, I think normally, I pray, <laughs> we don't want to kill people because of our jealousy. That deserves an amen, right? <laughs> but I think we... we we kind of want to rejoice maybe a little in our hearts when they're not knocked off the ladder. I think we can maybe kind of see this in sports a good bit. When someone who's kind of had success for a number of years, there's, a, there's kind of a growing contingent among the, the sports fandom that kind of start rooting for the person who's the, the best to fall. And there's an inner rooting that they would be um, – destroyed in some sense, their, their, their reign, their, their, their would, would fall. You know, s jealousy and selfish ambition are terrible gods and ruthless masters. The text says it's not from above, but it's earthly. And earthly is this, this idea of worldly wisdom that we kind of looked at last week. This, but it's, it's earthly, unspiritual, and what? Demonic. But jealousy and selfish ambition at its core, at its root, is from the devil. This is exactly what the devil tried to do in the garden. He tried to, to make Eve jealous of the things that God did not give to her. He said, if you eat that tree, you will become like God. And there's that jealousy that rose up in Eve's heart. I want to be like God. I don't want to submit to God. I want to be like God. How dare he? Sin in the world. So for us, are we fueling our tank with this worldly wisdom that's causing some bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in our in our hearts? Are we, are we living by heavenly wisdom or are we living by earthly wisdom? And how do we discover this? Well, this is the challenge for us. We need to, to take some time and some self-reflection to ask ourselves hard questions. How is this happening in my heart? You know, sometimes we, we see it how we're projecting things upon others. Now we see someone else's life and we see their happiness their success with their children, their, their physical features, their, their relationship that they have. And, and because you don't have it and you want it, you start in your heart resenting the person who is, who is having those things that you, that you don't. It manifests itself, I think, in bitterness towards that person. Maybe you're unhappy with a particular area of your life and, and your insecurity of that particular thing that you struggle with is now projected on somebody else. Whether that's your spouse, could be your children, 
Children, it could be your parents. It could be friends. We have to be careful. Are we projecting our own insecurities onto others? It could be because we're, we, because we're competing for someone else's affections. You know, maybe it's a, a child fighting for the attention of his, of his parents. Maybe that was you growing up and you never felt that you were recognized by your own parents, that one child was, was honored more than another. And you've developed this, this, um, this com, um, what's the word, this uh, way of thinking or this complex that you have to live a certain way to earn the approval of your parents because you never thought you received it because it was only given to one of the children. Now, parents, you may have children that you're doing the same thing with if you're not careful. That cry that says, notice me, see me. I think that, that cry is in each one of our, our hearts. We don't say it, but functionally, I think that's how we often live. And I think that there's another danger is just comparing yourself to others. I would just caution many of you uh, on the dangers of social media here. You know, I think that we have to be careful how we're fueling our our lives. And I think that sometimes we maybe, you know, in, in line at, at the grocery store, uh, sitting at home before you go to bed and you're just scrolling through your feeds, whether that's Instagram and, and Facebook. And what, what may be happening is there may be an onslaught of comparison coming into your heart. That may not be outright. It may just be a second. It may be a, 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 a blip. But what happens if you keep on drinking from that fountain? You may develop, uh, 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 what has God not given to me? God's done all these for others, and why won't he give it to, to me? Beloved, our battle every day is, 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 do we trust God with what he's given us? Is God good? Is God sovereign? And is he wise? Is God good? Does he love me? Is he wise for, to make me the person that I am, to give me the family that he put me in, to give me the skills that I have, the, the, the brains that I have, the, the humor that I have? Is God good? Is he sovereign? Is he in control? Is he wise to do this for us? As we think about this text, obviously James is, is teaching to a community of, uh, of believers here. It says wherever selfish ambition and jealousy exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. You know, just maybe ask to those two areas. There's, there's a lot of areas we could look at, but we're maybe two areas of maybe the home or the, or the church. You know, God is God of order. He wants things done decently and in order. Why? Because that reflects him. God has this word or a world kind of built and arranged in order. So we want to arrange our, our home and our church the, the same way. And maybe in your own home, uh, maybe spouses, analyze how you treat one another. Do, you, do your side comments and maybe sarcasm Really communicate your, your jealousy or how you're saying, notice me. I want my way in once in our marriage. Or parents, analyze your kid's behavior. Consider maybe they are responding to certain things out of jealousy and selfish ambition. Because kids don't have the ability to, to understand the inner workings of their hearts and understanding the why, right? They have the action. We see the, 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 the fruit. We have to help dig to help them see the root of why that's there. And that may be hard when they're six or seven, but it gets more important, imperative even, to do that when they're 14 and 15. Help them discover the inner workings of their heart. Or maybe to our church community, right? Uh, where is selfish ambition and jealousy here? You know, the attitude about what about me? You know, we as, as elders really want to use the entire body's gifts for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. Amen? Right? God is equipped. Our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Mind you, the main work of the ministry is that you would believe in Christ, that you'd be mature in him. But God has given you gifts. And some, some of you may feel that your gifts are not being used. Well, partly that's, that's a responsibility of the elders to, to work to use those gifts. But it could be that you're having jealousy or selfish ambition rise up in your heart and it's being projected on the church leadership or on people around you. Why am I not being used? Why am I not being recognized? So I would just say this, if you have any form of jealousy or selfish ambition in your heart towards others, I would just ask you to repent. 
because we don't want disorder in every vile practice. Lastly, number four, the wisdom of worship. The wisdom of worship. We see that right there at the, at the end. James kind of turns it. He says, but, verse 17, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. When you study this in the Greek, this is, uh, was really an affirmation of my own heart. Uh, I knew that I was a Southern Baptist because all my sermons have alliteration um, to make them sound really good and wise and beautiful. Well, if you read the Greek of this passage, uh, all the six things, they're all alliterated in, in the Greek, with the Greek word E. It sounds like ah. So James alliterated by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I'm going to keep on doing it, right? Um, but, but I don't think that because he alliterated it, I don't think, I think he was probably, you know, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, alliterated for our good and for his glory. But I think what he's trying to do here is not giving an exhaustive list. He's just saying this is, these are things that resemble a godly life. They resemble the life of a true Christian. If you are wise and understanding, live in this way. You know, you ever realize how much wisdom it takes to drive a car? We kind of forget about this because, you know, we, we're driving all, all over the place. But how many things did you have to know to drive a car? You know, you have to know about the, the different signs and all that they mean. You have to know how to, how to, how to you know, go fast, and how, to, how to slow down. You have to know how to, how to handle curves and, and go, go around. How, how do you handle the, the person who is, who's texting and driving on your right? How do you handle that situation? There's, there's all these things that are, that are coming out that you're trying to figure out. How, how, do, I, how do I be wise and handle this, this situation? You try to simply see and do the right thing when the situation presents itself. The effect of divine wisdom, one author would say, is to enable you and me to do just that in actual situations of life. The Bible does not tell you how to handle every situation, does it? There's a lot of things that you're not going to know how to do, but he's given you his Holy Spirit and he's given you enough things in his, in his word. He's given us everything that we need, the Bible says, for life and godliness. We just don't, we, those don't, don't know what that is. It kind of reminds you, even, even back to the beginning of J James chapter 1, how important wisdom is. It says what? If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And typically when we, when we pray that prayer, it's, I don't know what to do in this situation. But I think wisdom is far bigger than just particulars. What do I, where do I go to school, Right? Do I buy this car or not? Well, yes, we, we need to think about those particulars, but I think it's more how you live your life. Are you living your life for the Lord? If you're not living your life for the Lord and there's things in your life like jealousy and selfish ambition, God says, ask for wisdom. Ask God how you can overcome your jealousy. Ask God how you can overcome your selfish ambition, overcome your greed and your lust. Maybe you're not asking God with, with faith to give you the power to change your life. He wants to give it to you. He's a generous, generous, good father. And we see this list very briefly. We see it is pure. To be free from all things that characterize false wisdom. It's peaceable. It delights in peace, this wisdom from above. It's gentle. It's not combative or abrasive. It's reasonable, courteous. It's willing to yield. It's open to reason. When someone comes to you, you're not willing to, to always push back, but you're willing to listen and to hear. It's full of mercy, ready to show compassion to those who are in need. It's full of good fruits. That means it is rich in good deeds. It's without partiality. It does not show favoritism. It is without hypocrisy. It is sincere and genuine. It doesn't put up a front. No facade, no, no false things. It is true. What we see here at the end of verse 18, it says, And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Here's what the, the, the Bible is telling you and I to do. If we live with the wisdom of God, we are sowing righteousness. We're sowing righteousness for ourselves. We're sowing righteousness for our children, for our spouse, for our fellow church member, and for the lost. Because if you look at a life lived under Christ, 
I think over time, that life will look more consistent, more fruitful, more joyful. Even the songs the kings say today, rejoice in the Lord always. If you live your life by that, you will show the world that the way we live is better. Not because, of, not because we're better. <laughs> it's because we realize that we are not better, that we are sinners and in desperate need of a Savior, which is why he says, if you lack wisdom, dear friends, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. So, are you filling your tank with the right wisdom? Are you drinking from the fire hose of the world? Or are you basking and beholding the goodness of our God, desiring to live for him? I pray that you can honestly answer that question for yourself and then run to Christ. Father, we thank you that you are the God who gives us wisdom. God, I pray now that you would give generously to all without finding fault. God, let us come to you in faith, not waving back and forth uh, like that of a, of a wave on the ocean, but God, let us come fully depending that you are able to do what you have promised in your word. Bless us, God. Let us receive the word of God with the, the meekness of wisdom, understanding that we are frail and we need a savior. We need a redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name.